Although the United States has experienced several depressions before the stock market crash on October 27, 1929, none have been as severe nor as long-lasting before Black Thursday struck Wall Street. At first, economists and leaders thought that this was a mild bump, perhaps merely a correction of the market, or in any case, no worse than the recession the nation suffered after World War I. But the numbers seemed to prove the optimists wrong. The depression steadily worsened. By the spring of 1933, when FDR took the oath of office, unemployment had risen from 8 to 15 million. The gross national product had decreased from 103.8 billion to 55.7 billion. 40% of farmers in Mississippi were on the auction block on FDR's inauguration day. Although the depression was worldwide, no other country except Germany reached so high of a percentage of unemployed. The poor were hit the hardest. By 1932, Harlem had an unemployment rate of 50% and property owned or managed by blacks fell from 30% to 5% in 1935. Farmers in the Midwest were doubly hit by the economic downturns and the Dust Bowl. Schools with budgets shrinking shortened both school days and school years. No one knew how to best respond to the crisis. President Hoover believed that local government and private charities should provide relief to the unemployed and homeless. By 1931, some states had began to offer aid to local communities. FDR, then governor of New York, worked with Harry Hopkins and Francis Perkins to begin a direct work relief program. This helped only a, a varied few. By 1932, only one-fourth of employed families received any relief. In, in 1932, only 1.5% of all government funds were spent on relief and averaged about $1.67 per citizen. Cities which had to bear the brunt of relief efforts teetered on the edge of bankruptcy. By 1932, Cook County, Chicago, was firing firemen, police, and teachers who had not been paid in eight months. Breadlines and Hooverville's homeless encampments appeared across the nation. Despite the best efforts of President Roosevelt and his cabinet, the Great Depression continued. The nation's economy continued to struggle, unemployment persisted, and people grew angrier and more desperate. So in the spring of 1935, Roosevelt launched a second, more aggressive series of federal programs, sometimes called the Second New Deal. In April, he created the Works Progress Administration, or the WPA, to provide jobs for unemployed people. WPA projects weren't allowed to compete with private industry, so they focused on building things like posts, office, bridges, schools, highways, and parks. The WPA also gave work to artists, writers, theater directors, and musicians. The government's involvement with the funding of artists of different genres not only advanced art in America, but it gave them a platform to express what people were feeling in that time. Whether it be photography, painting, or music, the Great Depression was the breakout that art needed to be solidified in America. If the New Deal did not happen, America would be worse for it, not only financially, but artistically as well. The crisis also jolted American art away from the pretentiousness and forced it to confront harsh realities. In doing so, it gained an identity. Previously apart from the mid-19th century Hudson River School of Landscapists, the country had largely looked to Europe for inspiration. First to the Impressionist, then the Post-Impressionist, and then to the Cubist. The Depression helped, helped to group together such a desperate individualists as Edward Hopper, Georgia O'Keeffe, and Grant Wood. Even Jackson Pollock into something approaching a national caucus. Franklin D. Roosevelt, the author of the New Deal, said, art is not a treasure in the past or an importation from another land, but part of the present life in all living and creating peoples. It was agriculture that highlighted most clearly the lack of artistic consensus. Some regionalist painters, among them 
Thomas Hart Benton, and Grant Wood depicted farm life not as a struggle against drought, failing crops, and soil degradation, but as Arcadia. Others, such as Charles Steeler, painted cityscapes, seeing America's industrial centers as the last best hope for economic redemption. But the Arch Project also sparked controversy. Some politicians believed them to be wasteful propaganda and wanted them ended. Others wanted them expanded. Such controversy, along with the United States' entry into World War II, eventually killed the projects. We can see this return during the Great Recession. Although artists were not government-subsidized, they were still able to express themselves similarly. The Great Recession was a period of general economic decline in world markets during the late 2000s and early 2010s. The scale and timing of the recession varied from country to country. In terms of overall impact, the International Monetary Fund concluded that it was the worst global recession since the Great Depression in the 1930s. The Great Recession resulted in scarcity of valuable assets in the market economy and the collapse of the financial sector in the world economy. The banks were bailed out by the U.S. government. In summary, although the Great Depression was a horrid time for America, it also shined light on areas that needed improving, like funding of art. Art exploded during the time and evolved into something that was truly unique to the American experience. Even though the cause of this was unfortunate, it was a need to further advance our society and create new and truly different forms of 